This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. Welcome to World's Last Chance Radio. I'm your host, Miles Roby, and joining me is Dave Wright. Greetings. So glad you could join us today. WLC is a Christian radio station, but you're not going to hear us talking about God or the Lord. Mm. <laughs> can, I, can I just hear our first-time listener right now going, What? What? <laughs> How, how can you be a Christian radio station if you don't talk about the Lord? Well, okay, we do talk about the Heavenly Father. I just wanted to see if everyone was paying attention. Now, Scripture urges believers to call upon the name of the Lord. But it doesn't actually say the Lord. It gives us his personal name, which is Yahweh or Yah. He never said to call upon him using a generic title that equally applies to heathen gods. Yeah, uh, we, well, Hindus have Lord Krishna, uh, Lord Vishnu. If all you're saying is the Lord, how do you know which one you're talking about? There's a very good reason we're told to call upon the name of Yahweh. His name is a verb of being. In Exodus chapter 3, it's translated as I am that I am. But you look up the original words and it is simply to be. It is a verb of being. So, when you speak of Yahweh, know that every verb of being applies to him. Am, is, are, was, were, be, being, been. They all describe him because he is the self-existent one. Yes, yeah, very beautiful. It is, and it's very powerful too because his very name as a verb of being is a promise that whatever our needs are, he is present and capable to provide for us in every situation and under any contingency. I like how the son's name incorporates the name of the father. The father's name is Yahuwah. The son's name is Yahushua, which means literally Yahuwah saves. And I would add that if we're reading a quote by non-biblical authors that refer to Jesus or God or Lord, we use their actual names as we believe the writers would have. You know, they had themselves known the true names of the Father and the Son. And at WLC, our mission is to take truth to the world to warn people that the Saviour is coming soon. A lot of our programmes focus on the last day events, prophecy, some really heavy topics as well. So generally, when we're thinking about how to present a day's topic, we look for some light-hearted way to introduce the day's topic if possible. It's a talent that I actually learned from my mum. You know, any time that she was under stress, any time things were falling apart around her, she'd crack a joke. Uh, it used to drive my dad crazy. <laughs> uh, but her attitude was always, if the choice is to laugh or cry, might as well laugh. So I learned from her. And any time in school things got a bit too serious, yet again, I'd crack a joke. And my, my mates loved this. <laughs> Uh, and the teachers, may I ask? Well, not, not so much, Dave. <laughs> uh, you know, they'd always tell my parents that my humour was inappropriate. Uh, it's not that it was dirty or anything like that. But it was just simply, you know, the timing. They'd be making some important point. Everything's dead silent and, you know, I'd crack a joke. The kids would laugh, I'd feel better, and the teacher would feel irritated. Yes, and I can see why that wouldn't go over quite so well. <laughs> yeah, well, I couldn't figure out any light-hearted illustration for today's topic, though, so I did what the school kids do. I Googled it. <laughs> and you <laughs> they do. And you know what? I think I managed to hit on the, the one topic in life for which there are no jokes. And what is that? The Antichrist. <laughs> you seriously Googled jokes about the Antichrist? Well, not jokes per se, just something light for introducing the topic, Dave. But there's 
nothing out there. There's a lot of speculation, of course, as to the identity of the Antichrist, but no, no light-hearted references. Well, I suppose it's not a light-hearted topic, is it? No, no. Antichrist, the very word, conjures up mental images of absolute evil, some future person or entity who mesmerises mankind with a masterful and overwhelming deception. And since none of us want to be mind-controlled or deceived, believers want to know just who it is. None of us want to be taken by surprise. A variety of theories regarding the Antichrist's identity have been offered, suggesting different possibilities as to who it might be. Yeah, I mean, that there are thousands of denominations within Christianity. I'd hazard a guess that there are nearly as many theories as the identity of the Antichrist. And I think you'd probably be not far mm. wrong on that one. Most of the suggestions tend to come from Protestants. Ideas range from the very broad to the very specific. Some churches say the Antichrist is an evil principle. Others warn that it is a Muslim, while others say that it is a demon. And other denominations get far more specific. Some believe that the Antichrist is the devil incarnate into human flesh. And I found one place that went so far as to say the Antichrist is the President of the United States, Donald Trump. <laughs> Seriously? Well, I'm sure he's got enough political enemies who would love to make that charge to stick to him. <laughs> other suggestions have been that the Antichrist is the Pope or a person from the distant past, such as the Roman Emperor known for his persecution of Christians. For example, Nero or Diocletian, Julian, Caligula, etc. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what do Roman Catholics believe, though? Well, Roman Catholics, as you know, make up the largest denomination in Christianity, and they have long claimed that Antichrist is a real human being. Now, here's a quote from the Catholic Encyclopedia Online that I just pulled up. Can you see it on your screen there? Yeah. Why don't you read it for us? OK, right. This is from um, Catholic.org, and it says, quote, Antichrist is an individual person, a single enemy of Christ. This excludes the contention of those who explain Antichrist either as the whole collection of those who oppose Jesus Christ or as the papacy. The individual person of Antichrist will not be a demon, as some of the ancient writers believed, nor will he be the person of the devil incarnated in the human nature of Antichrist. He will be a human person, perhaps of Jewish extraction. Now, the interesting thing is there is actually some truth to each of these suggestions, mm. as we can see from the definition of Antichrist. Yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, what does the word Antichrist actually mean? Well, it comes from the Greek word Antichristos. Real enlightening, Dave. <laughs> well, I brought my new strong <laughs> expanded dictionary of words. Why don't you read the definition for us? <laughs> it's just there on that page there. It's number 500. OK. Uh, it says, quote, Antichristos can mean either against Christ or instead of Christ, or perhaps combining the two, you know, the root words, one who, assuming the guise of Christ, opposes Christ and takes his place. The Antichristos denies Yahushua in the flesh is the Christ. The Pseudo-Christos affirms himself to be the Christ. The problem with each of these suggested interpretations, of course, is that they are too narrow in scope. I've noticed that too. So often with interpreting Bible prophecy, our focus is just too small. The actual fulfilment of any given prophecy always ends up being bigger and uh, more far-reaching than we can typically expect. The same is true when it comes to the Antichrist. A careful study of prophecy reveals just who or what the Antichrist is – and it's huge. Mm. The Antichrist is both a system and a person. That's a new one to me, both a system and a person. So who or what would those be? Based on the accumulated evidence presented in Scripture, I firmly believe that the Roman Catholic Church itself is the biblically foretold Antichrist system. Think about it. It's the largest organised religious system in the world. Its tentacles reach to every country on earth. Its educational system has influenced minds and shaped laws for centuries. Mm, that makes sense. I mean, its, its system of confessionals constitutes the largest information gathering infrastructure on earth. And it's been around for a lot longer than the tracking giant of Google, of course. So if the Roman Catholic Church is the Antichrist system, who's the person of the Antichrist? Is it the Black Pope? Well, plenty of people do believe the so-called Black Pope, the head of the Jesuit order, is really the power behind the papal throne. But this is what makes it so interesting. I believe that Scripture pinpoints the actual Pope as being the person of the Antichrist, specifically this Pope, 
Pope Francis. Oh, that is interesting. As we all know, Pope Francis is the first Jesuit pope in history. Not only that, but a careful study of Revelation 17 reveals that Pope Francis is the prophesied eighth and final pope. He is the last pope we shall ever have. Just allow me to interject really quickly. If you missed mm. our programme on Revelation 17, you can still listen to it. Past radio programmes posted all over our website. Just go to worldslastchance.com, click on the WLC radio icon, and you can listen to them there on YouTube as well. Dave. Thanks, Miles. The idea that the Pope is the Antichrist first arose in the 11th century, although the idea didn't really gain popularity until the Protestant reformers of the 16th century began teaching it. Martin Luther wrote that the papacy is, quote, nothing else than the kingdom of Babylon and of very Antichrist. For who is the man of sin and the son of perdition, but he who by his teaching and his ordinances increases the sin and perdition of souls in the church, while he yet sits in the church as if he were Yah? All these conditions have now for many ages been fulfilled by the papal tyranny." Unquote. That's quite a statement there. No wonder the church tried to kill him. And from there, the belief spread like wildfire. Now, here's a quote from Matthias Flacius, a Lutheran reformer, published in 1570. Would you read it for us, please? Absolutely. The reason for our separation from the Pope and his followers be this. By many writings of our church, by the divinely inspired word, by prophecies concerning the future, and by the special characteristics of the papacy. It has been profusely and thoroughly proved that the Pope, with his prelates and clergy, is the real true great Antichrist, that his kingdom is the real Babylon, a never-ceasing fountain and a mother of all abominable idolatry." Unquote. The system of Antichrist is primarily the Roman Catholic Church. She is the mother, but she has many daughters. These are the Protestant churches who pay homage to the Pope by clinging to worship days calculated on the papal Gregorian calendar. Well, you could say that all organised religions fall under the canopy of being a daughter of Babylon, couldn't you? After all, they all use the Gregorian calendar either for worship days or for daily business and commerce. Yes, and it's from these organisations that Yahweh commands us in Revelation 18 verse 4... Go out of her, my people. This command is to everyone, no exemptions. Because all religious organisations have either clung to error, rejected new light, or both. OK, just hold the thought there. We're going to take a really quick break. We'll be back in a mo. Shortly before his death, the Savior foretold that all who follow truth would be persecuted for their faith. Revelation also reveals that in the near future, man-made laws will seek to usurp the divine law. Romans 13 is one passage of scripture that will be used in the near future to coerce Christians into obeying human laws in violation of the divine law. If someone tried to compel your conscience by quoting from Romans 13, telling you that the powers that be are ordained by Yah, how would you answer? What would you say? For a clear understanding of the true meaning of Romans 13, go to our website, worldslastchance.com and read The Believer's Civil Duty. Again, look for the Believer's Civil Duty on worldslastchance.com. We're back, and in talking about the Antichrist, Dave has shared with us that the Antichrist is both a system, which we've seen is Roman Catholicism, and the many Christian denominations that have grown out of her, but still clung to her errors, and is also a person, specifically Pope Francis, the eighth and the last Pope spoken of in Revelation 17. Catholicism fits the definition of Antichrist because its doctrines are against Christ. 
Catholic doctrines have led to the enslavement of entire races and the slaughter of countless millions who could not be compelled to sin against their conscience. That kind of force is the exact opposite of Yahushua. Luke 4 verse 18 gives a brief description of the Saviour's mission. It's so simple, yet profound as well. Just give me a moment just to look it up. Um, I've got it here. Uh, It says, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. That's the exact opposite of the convert or die Christianity of Catholicism. Force will always be an identifying characteristic of false religion. Wherever it's used, you can know Satan is behind it. Pope Francis, likewise, is the foretold Antichrist because he is literally instead of Christ. Catholics teach the Pope is holy, the Vicar of Christ, or Christ on earth. Vicar is the English form of the Latin word vicarius, or in place of. Let's take a look at what the Catholic Encyclopedia says. Would you just read this quote for us, please? Yep, sure. Vicar of Christ, from the Latin vicarius Christi, a title of the Pope implying his supreme and universal primacy, both of honour and of jurisdiction over the Church of Christ. The title Vicar of Christ is most expressive of his supreme headship of the Church on earth, which he bears in virtue of the commission of Christ and with vicarial power derived from him. The title Vicar of God, used for the Pope by Nicholas III, is employed as an equivalent for Vicar of Christ. This is grossly offensive. This Mm. is blasphemous. Yahuwah has never authorised anyone to replace him or his son on earth. Again, this is blasphemous against Yahuwah, against his son and against the very kingdom of heaven. Yahuwah used the Protestant Reformation to reveal light on many truths that had been lost or hidden for centuries under the accumulated rubbish of error and tradition. Truth is powerful, and when the truth was presented to the people, those minds that accepted it were led to reject the errors of Catholicism. I remember studying this. The Reformation couldn't be stopped, and it frightened the powers that be within Catholicism. I remember reading that the Counter-Reformation was the papacy's attempt to stop the progress of Protestantism. Correct. This is when the Jesuit order was established. They counteracted the Reformation by offering alternative explanations of Scripture to meet the accusations of the Reformers. See, the Reformers had truth on their side. Their teaching was powerful. They could clearly connect prophecy with the Pope. Obviously, the Roman Curia couldn't put a halt to this, so instead they provided alternate interpretations of prophecy to deflect the preaching of the Reformers that the Pope himself was Antichrist. I think a lot of people overlook the history of the Jesuit order as well, but like you said, it was established for the express purpose of spreading the Roman Catholic version of Christianity to the world. And at the time, the conversion of Muslims was also one of their goals. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, actually. It was formed to spread Catholicism. I don't think it was formed expressly to counter Protestantism, but as part of its mandate, it very quickly became used that way. Jesuit scholars are some of the most well-educated men in the world. They had the skill and cunning to counter Protestant teachings with their own interpretations, which, of course, brought many back into the fold, so to speak. Mm. Um, Just as a point, have you actually ever read the oath all Jesuits are required to take? I don't know. It's it's quite grisly. Uh, I've pulled it up here on my screen, the oath. Can you see that there? Listen while I read... Yeah, I'm just going to read part of it. And again, folks, this is the vow your friendly neighbourhood Jesuit took to become a member of their order. Okay, now it says, I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity present, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women, and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate forever their execrable race. Unquote. And the Pope is one of them. Pope Francis. He, he took this evil oath. His being made Pope is really fascinating. 
Jesuits have always exercised influence behind the scenes, but Francis is the first Jesuit pope ever. Now, this is significant. The correlation between Francis as the first Jesuit pope, while at the same time also being the eighth pope of Revelation 17, can't be overemphasised. NBC News World quickly saw the significance of his pontificate. They said, quote, Pope Francis is unique not just for being the first Latin American pope, he's also the first Jesuit pope, possibly signalling a renewed emphasis on traditional Catholic theology by the church, unquote. And that is significant. Can you just read this for us? It's an NBC News article. Michael Sheeran, a Jesuit priest and president of the Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities, is commenting on the Pope's quiet, simple life in Argentina. Now, just have a look down there, Mars, and read for us where it's marked. OK, I can see that. That simplicity hides a steely determination to advance Jesuit principles, especially on the importance of traditional Catholic teachings and protection of the poor and the oppressed, Sheeran said. He was a tough guy who made sure his men towed the mark. I think you'll find a man who is conservative theologically, but very strong on matters of social justice, Sheeran said. These are portentous words. The Jesuits were responsible for spreading an alternative explanation for the Antichrist that deflected the attention from the Pope and Catholicism. Uh, well, and a theologically conservative Pope is far more likely to lead the way in a return to the papal persecutions of the past in defence of the faith than one who is more moderate in his views. Yeah, that's very true. Now, we have to remember the papacy received a deadly wound in 1798 when General Louis Berthier took the Pope prisoner. However, the process of giving the papacy a deadly wound actually began in 1793 when the French government introduced a new calendar for the sole purpose of destroying any link to Christianity. Weeks on this new calendar were ten days long. There was no Sunday in the calendar of the French Republic. Now, it's very interesting. The papacy has always claimed that her proof of authorities and the fact that she changed the day of worship from the biblical Sabbath to Sunday, a calendar that entirely removed Sunday from the calendar, would be a blow aimed directly at the power and authority of the papacy. You see, most people don't know these facts of history. In recent years, it's become politically incorrect to label the Pope as the Antichrist. But as the head of the Antichrist system... That's exactly what he is. Even Protestants have come up with alternate suppositions of who or what the Antichrist is. And all this plays right into the devil's hands. And people are deceived when they're taught that the fulfilment of prophecy is yet future. While in reality, that very same prophecy is currently being fulfilled. Christians are looking for the Antichrist to appear in the future when he is here already. Now, you've got your Bible there, Miles. Could you just yeah. turn to Second Thessalonians chapter 2? <laughs> this putting off to the future what's being fulfilled today is precisely what Paul is warning about here. Can you just read verses 3 and 4, please? Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Eloah. God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as Yahuwah in the temple of Eloah, showing himself that he is Eloah. The world is being deceived. They're expecting the imminent emergence of the Antichrist, while the real Antichrist is already here, consolidating his power base and getting ready to fulfil his role in end-time events. That's when we're going to see a revival of past persecutions, when he tries to force everyone to receive the mark of the beast on pain of death. Several times today we've mentioned that Pope Francis is the last Pope, fulfilling the prophecy of Revelation 17. So let's take a look at that. John is shown a beast ridden by a harlot. Can you read verses 9 to 11 for us? This is the angel's explanation of what John saw. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. The Lateran Pact of 1929 was a significant development in the healing of the papacy's deadly wound. This agreement gave full political independence to the Pope, making Vatican City its own sovereign city-state. 
As we've said before, we firmly believe that the eight kings in Revelation 17 refer to the last eight popes that reign on earth before the return of Yahushua. Count them up. There have been eight popes, counting Pope Pius XI, who signed the Lateran Pact with Mussolini in 1929. The papacy is more popular than ever today. Yeah, and as a result, it's more powerful than ever. Even Protestants turn out to see the Pope when he travels around the world. Protestants used to be the first in declaring the Pope as Antichrist, but now they're so blinded, they become angry or dismissive when the topic is broached, so he just gets more and more powerful and influential. It's both ironic and tragic that multitudes of Christians are looking for a future emergence of the Antichrist when he's already here. If you've missed our previous programmes on the trumpets, please go back and listen to them again. In the near future, as the trumpets of Revelation 9 are being sounded, Pope Francis is going to be promoted to an unprecedented position of power. When this happens, he will use the power of the United States to impose a Sunday law on the world. And how is this going to look there, Dave? Is he going to force everyone to go to church on Sunday? No, he doesn't need to do that. Simply mm. by making it a day of no work, no sports, nothing to do but focus on personal relationships, people will be abstaining from work and honouring the Pope's day. This is all in place, folks. There's very little left to happen between now and when the Pope is exalted. And don't forget, he's a very old man. Right. So what's prophesied to happen will be happening quickly. There's no time to waste. Antichrist is here and he's already influencing the world through the errors contained in all the organised religions of the world. This is why heaven's command is, Go out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. It's no time to play around with error. We've got to obey and leave all organized religions, trusting in Yahweh to be our guide. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Divine love is eternal love. It flows from the great heart of Yahweh. His love is the single most powerful force in the universe. It is the very essence of who and what He is. Yahushua is a perfect revelation of Yahweh's love. The Son demonstrated how the Father would act what he would say, what he would do under any and all circumstances. Eternal love is fully revealed in Yah's gift of his Son. The natural response of the heart that feels loved is to love in return, because love awakens love. To learn more about the infinite, inexhaustible love the Father has for you, look for the three-part article series, Eternal Love, on our website at worldslastchance.com. Again, read the Eternal Love series on worldslastchance.com. Fall in love with the best friend you will ever have. Our question today from our daily mailbag is coming to us from Tapio van Hannen in Espoo, Finland. Do you want to know something interesting? Well, what's that? Finnish athletes have won more medals per capita at the Summer Olympics than anyone else in the world, and they're second only to Norway for the number of medals per capita won at the Winter Olympics. Very good. Didn't know that. <laughs> I do now. I thank thought you'd you. like to know. Very, yeah, thank you. I really do appreciate that. Uh, anyway, Tapio says, I have a cousin who is struggling with alcoholism. I want to help him, but I'm not sure how. What can Christians do for someone struggling with addiction? Well, Tapio, I'm really glad to have been asked this because it's often easy when hearing about someone else's struggles to distance ourselves for no other reason than well, we don't have a problem with that. But the, the truth is, Sin is addictive. Now, that's all sin. So whether that sin is alcohol or nicotine, drugs, porn, escapism, anger, selfishness, cheating in school, dishonesty in business dealings, whatever it is, it's all addictive. So the principles that apply to helping an alcoholic apply to helping anyone struggling with sin. That makes total sense. So what's the first thing that we can actually do, though? The first and most important thing that any of us can do is don't denounce 
The sin your friend is struggling with may not be a temptation to you, but guaranteed you have your own areas of weakness. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of Yah. Secondly, we need to give them the same unconditional love that Yah has for us. Yahushua didn't wait for us to clean ourselves up. He saved us anyway. Let's just take a look at Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 10. This passage is one of the most powerful in Scripture, and it should inspire faith in anyone struggling with sin. It proves that Yahweh loves his enemies so much that he's willing to die for them. Okay, I have it here, and it says, quote, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But Yah demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to Yahweh through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Satan loves to press guilt on us because he knows that guilt is the most effective way to keep sinners away from the Saviour. Oh yeah, yeah, guilt over past sins, that can be really tough to deal with. But think about it for a moment. Mm -hmm. When Yahushua died on the cross, how many of your sins had yet to be committed? Well, all of them. I hadn't been born then. Exactly. And yet the Father's love is so great and so unconditional that Yahushua died for your sins and mine before we'd even been born. Remember that because our salvation is not based upon our performance, our abstinence from sin, it's based on what Yahushua did at Calvary. Yes, we're sinners, but Yah's grace is sufficient for even the worst of sinners. Amen. And if we want to be like him, we won't abandon someone who is struggling with an addiction. We won't judge or denounce him either. Just uh, turn over there to Hebrews 12. This yep. is an important point for anyone who wants to help someone struggling with an addiction. Just read for us verse 11, please, from Hebrews 12. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. As any loving parent knows, it's not fun to discipline your child, even if he or she deserves it. But sometimes it's necessary. When a friend or loved one is struggling with substance abuse, we can't just ignore it. We'd want help if we were in trouble, and we owe it as Yahushua's followers to help those we find in need. It's part of being a Christian. Yeah, and I think it's this is where a lot of us stumble. You know, people struggling with addictions may deny that they have a problem, but deep inside, they're typically well aware that they do. But it can feel overwhelming to try and quit, you know, say smoking or drinking. They often lash out. So what's the best way to approach someone who's been clearly battling addiction then, Dave? Gently, mm -hmm. being careful to respect their dignity. Yeah. Do it in private, don't embarrass them. Most of all... Be very loving, understanding and non-judgmental, just as we want Yahweh to be when we turn to him for help with our sins. Mm -hmm. You see, if we sound harsh or condemnatory, if we come across as judgmental, we can do more harm than good. They can, in self-defense, reject anything we have to offer. But what do you think of um, Alcoholics Anonymous or similar 12-step recovery programs? Personally, I think it's a good idea for someone struggling with addiction to have someone to encourage and support him or her. It would be a lot more difficult to struggle through alone, wouldn't it? I think Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12-step recovery idea has helped a lot of people. I also think that this idea that once you're an alcoholic, you'll always be an alcoholic is helpful in the sense of being aware that when we've struggled with a particular sin, it's much easier to fall again in that area. Mm. However, this does not mean it's impossible to overcome. In Yahushua, it's possible to overcome any and every addiction by faith in Yah's promises and the merits of the Saviour's blood. I, I like the promise in John 16, verse 33. It, it says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Yeah, that's wonderful, isn't it? That's where mm. our hope lies. And it's there from which we draw strength to overcome. But it's important to understand that when a brother or sister is struggling, we're not to leave them to it. Could you just read First Samuel chapter 12, yeah. verse 23? 
This one here is a particularly powerful verse, and it shows the responsibility that each one of us has for our fellow sinners. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against Yahweh in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Again, turn it round. If you were struggling, wouldn't you want someone to pray for you? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you want someone to claim the merits of Yahushua's blood on your behalf for victory? <laughs> I know I would. Absolutely. And it's that, that's encouraging. And and, and that's what sinners need, not condemnation to make them feel even more helpless, hopeless and guilty. You know, I've always appreciated the description of the Saviour in Isaiah 42 verse 3, which says, A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. Yahushua didn't go around condemning others. No, he didn't kick a man when he was down. He always encouraged and uplifted, pointing the person who is struggling to the Father. And this is how we're to help others too. Share the promises with them. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now that's a promise for every situation. Mm. One thing that every addict needs, regardless of the addiction, is outside help. Sometimes this can be had through modern medicine. Sometimes counselling can help. But always... Be a friend. Be yeah. quick to uplift them in prayer. Be there to encourage them. Accountability also really helps the person who is struggling to overcome an addiction, and that requires someone who cares enough to get involved. One thing that's really helped me overcome certain sins has been in the morning to make a point of asking the Father to warn me when I'm in danger of being tempted. It's maybe through poor choices on my part. It may be through something completely beyond my control. But when I ask the Father to let me know when I'm in danger, I can ask him for help and strength before my emotions are even involved. Before I reach the point of really, really wanting whatever it is, I can just say a quick prayer for strength. And that, that's, that's really made a difference for me, Dave. Yeah, that's really helpful, actually. A person who's an alcoholic won't want to go to a liquor store. A person who's addicted to porn can set the controls on his computer so he can't access those sites. But sometimes, as we all know, Satan does a sneak attack. And when we're caught by surprise, it's easy to stumble. I like asking the Father to be your early warning system. Jack Wellman is a Christian author. He's written about overcoming addiction from a Christian perspective. And I've got a quote here that I've just printed off and I'd like you to read. It's just right there. You can see where I've marked it. Yeah, OK. It says, The next time you see someone battling with alcoholism or some other addiction, either illegal substances or even prescriptions, remember that they are battling something that they cannot overcome alone. We need to come alongside them as accountability partners, and we must include them in our plans to make them feel part of the Christian community. The truth is, we all struggle with our own addictions and lust-based sins. It is by the grace of Yah that we ourselves are not in their shoes. So it's up to us to pray for them, encourage them, and help them in any way we can, but without them taking advantage of us. There's a fine line between helping them and stripping all hope away. The best way to help someone struggling with addiction is to point them to the Father as the only source of real help. Pray for them. Teach them to claim the promises. Be willing to engage. Be an accountability partner. If there is a medical issue driving this, get them the help they need. This is being Yah's hands, his feet, his, his voice on earth. Yeah, and as we do this to others, Yahuwah accounts it as being done to help him. Now that's all we've got time for today with your questions. If you've got any more, then please drop us a line. Go to our website, worldslastchance.com, click on contact us. We might not be able to address everything on air, but at least we'll try to get it addressed in our Q&A section on our website. This is Elisa Bryan with today's Daily Promise from Yah's Word. In Luke 15, Yahushua told the story of a man with two sons. 
The younger son, being <laughs> rather spoiled and self-indulgent, demanded his father give him his share of the inheritance early. Just as soon as the youth received it, he left the family farm and moved to the city. You know the story. It wasn't long before the young man had squandered all his money, and when a famine came, he was out of money, out of food, and had no opportunities to earn either. He realized that his father's servants were better off than he was, and determined to return home, beg his father's forgiveness, and ask to work as a servant. He didn't presume to think he could be reinstated as a cherished son. He knew he had done wrong. But if he could just work as a servant, he'd be grateful. He traveled toward home. But here is where his experience took an abrupt departure from his expectations. Yahushua said that while he was still a great way off, his father saw him, ran to him, and embraced him. The young man had barely gotten out his apology, and before he even had a chance to ask to be allowed to work as a servant, his father was whipping off his own outer robe and wrapping it around his son. He was calling to the servants to hurry and prepare a feast to celebrate his son's return. You see, every single day he had been gone, his father had been missing him. What's more, he had been watching for him. While the son was still a great way off, his father saw him and ran to him because he had been looking and longing for him. The Persian poet Rumi once wrote, What you seek is seeking you. No truer words could be spoken. Do you feel lost and forsaken? Are you looking for internal peace but don't know how to obtain it? Arise and go to your father. He will meet you a great way off. If you take even one step toward him in repentance, he will hasten to enfold you in his arms of infinite love. His ear is open to the cry of the contrite soul. The very first reaching out of the heart after Yah is known to him. Never a prayer is offered, however faltering. Never a tear is shed, however secret. Never a sincere desire after Yahweh is cherished, however feeble. But His Spirit goes forth to meet it. Even before the prayer is uttered, or the yearning of the heart made known, the grace from Yahushua goes forth to meet the grace that is working upon the human soul. Haven't you waited long enough? Don't delay any longer. Go. He's waiting just for you. We've been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. out of time but I'd, I'd just like to say that this is a very difficult topic to cover because it can feel very personal can't it you know if you're a Roman Catholic it can feel like a personal attack and we don't mean it that way truth is there are many very sincere people in every single faith community including the Catholic Church we're, we're not here to denounce individuals we're here to share what prophecy reveals about the future so that everyone can be warned. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Revelation 3 verse 13. Mm -hmm. So important to pay attention to the warnings of Scripture. These aren't personal attacks. This is heaven trying to warn us of the devil's plans. Because let me tell you folks, we haven't seen anything yet. The days ahead will be like nothing anyone has ever seen before. In Revelation 6, we learn about an event that's just on the horizon, the sixth seal. During this event, there will be a tremendous earthquake. The detritus spewed into the air will, according to Revelation 6, verse 12, darken the sun and turn the moon to blood. Not only that, but verse 14 says, quote, Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. We've never seen anything like this before. It's going to terrify the world. 
The really incredible thing is when you realise that the sixth seal is but the precursor to the trumpets described in Revelation 8 and 9. While the word trumpets is symbolic, the events described are very real. The first trumpet, described in Revelation 8, verse 7, is going to be meteorites striking the earth. The resulting fires will burn up one-third of all living vegetation on the earth. And that's pretty serious. It's the plant life that not only feeds us, but purifies the air we breathe as well. The second trumpet, verse 8, speaks of a meteor hitting the ocean. This too will have a catastrophic effect, with one-third of the sea life dying and one-third of all the ocean-going ships being destroyed. The third trumpet, described in verses 10 and 11, sounds like another meteor strike, this one falling on a primary source of fresh water and further contaminating not only rivers, but aquifers as well. I mean, these just keep getting worse and worse, and you've got the disruption of the food supply, then you've got the disruption of worldwide shipping, now you've got the contamination of major water supplies. And of course, we know that with contaminated water supplies, there's uncontrolled spread of disease. We're in for a real time of it. But that's why Yah has given us these warnings. It's why he's given us the countdown of the kings, so we can know to get ready. The fourth trumpet is unique because it darkens the light in the heavens. That may not sound too bad, but it only gets worse. Yeah, that's right. We don't have time to read through it, but please read it on your own. If you don't have your own Bible, you can borrow one or you can read it online. But you need to know these prophecies because this is why Yahweh has warned us about the Antichrist. The fifth trumpet is revealed in Revelation 9. It describes an invasion of demons that have disguised themselves to look like aliens from outer space. During this demonic invasion, several things are going to happen. They will torment people for a literal time span of five months. Not the righteous, though. No, no, indeed. Yah's people will be protected. But it's still not going to be a stroll in the park, either. And it's because of the events under this trumpet that Yahweh has warned us of the Antichrist. As the torment of the demons, who everyone will think are extraterrestrials, as their tormenting gets worse, the world will get desperate. They'll ask the Pope to represent the human race in negotiations with the so-called aliens. Acting as mankind's representative, the Pope will broker a peace deal with the invaders. This will only increase his power and influence. And the first thing he's going to do with that power and influence is to get the world's governments to pass a law enforcing Sunday as the world's day of worship. It makes sense. In time of chaos and danger, individual civil liberties are given up for the greater good. I wonder if the Pope will threaten a return of the aliens if people don't conform. It's very likely that's precisely what will happen, yes. Fear is always a great motivator for societal change, and fear is what the Pope, the Antichrist, will use to enforce the mark of the beast, which is worship on Sunday, calculated by his counterfeit calendar. Well, yeah, the Catholic Church has always boasted of their role in changing the day of worship to Sunday, and the vast majority of Christendom has followed their example. Don't forget, though, that even in countries where they don't go to church on Sunday, the very fact that Sunday is part of the weekend gives homage to the Pope's day of worship and in turn dishonours the Creator. This is what all the passages warning believers of the Antichrist are preparing us for. And that's not all. Sometime after the Pope has been elevated to this new powerful position, heading up the world's religions, Satan himself will appear, pretending to be the saviour. In this guise, he will claim to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday. And that will really carry weight with everyone who's been deceived into thinking the Pope is this wonderful, kindly, grandfatherly figure. He's not. He is the Antichrist, and he plays a central role in Satan's end-time delusions. Don't let loyalty to an institution blind you to the danger that is the Pope. Satan was behind the selection of this Pope and he has grand plans for him. Do you know the Bible so well? Do you know Yahweh so well? That when the Antichrist passes laws enforcing the worship on Sunday, you will stay faithful to Yah and Yah alone? That is a test facing every single one of us. And the choices we're making today determine the choice we'll make then. Join us again tomorrow. And until then, remember, Yahweh loves you and he is safe to trust.
If you would like to hear past episodes of WLC Radio, you can find them on our website at worldslastchance.com or look for them on YouTube. of the WLC reward system, World's Last Chance is eager to partner with you in preparing for heaven. In our WLC store, we offer a collection of items designed to aid you in your spiritual journey. There are books, audiobooks, resources on CD-ROM and MP3, videos, as well as a number of truth-sharing tools for holding your own Bible studies with friends and neighbours. We even have a youth section with items to appeal to the younger members of the family. The best part? You don't have to pay a single cent for any of it. This is where the reward system comes in. When you become a registered member on our website, there are a variety of ways by which you can earn reward points to be spent in our store. There are currently 31 e-courses available for study on our website. Each completed e-course accrues points. The accumulated points earned will be instantly transferred to the member's account once the course is complete. You can earn over 6,000 points on e-courses alone. But that's not all. Correctly answering the daily quiz, responding to the weekly survey and even accessing an English content item can all earn you points. The points you earn can then be spent on the items available in our WLC store. We mail to anywhere in the world at no cost to you. We'll even cover the cost of shipping and handling. Visit our website at worldslastchance.com. Start earning points today. Not all items are available in all languages. Visit our website today to see what's available in your language. Thank you for listening to this episode on WLC Radio. We're living in very solemn times. The world is hovering on the brink of disaster. Catastrophic events will soon take place that will bring this age to a close and usher in the next. In His great mercy, Yahuwah has revealed through prophecy what the future holds. Revelation 8 foretells a series of events, each one worse than the last, that will devastate the earth. The world's food supplies will be decimated. Famine and its accompanying pestilence will result. The Earth's fresh water supplies will also be affected. Revelation 9 reveals that demons will impersonate extraterrestrials. The terror and devastation of this so-called alien invasion will make people desperate for safety at any cost. The freedom to live and worship as the conscience dictates will become a thing of the past. Many lives will be lost during this series of events, and when the mark of the beast is enforced, there will be martyrs. Each event prepares for the next crisis. In one long last call of mercy to repent, for Yahuwah is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Shortly following the events described in Revelation 8 and 9, the seven last plagues will be poured out. These plagues are unprecedented in human history. 
In a very real sense, these events will empty the earth. Isaiah 24 warns, quote, Behold, Yahuwah maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again." Unquote. For believers, however, there is hope. In describing the end of this age, Yahushua said in Luke 21 verse 28, quote, When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Unquote. Yes, the end will be traumatic. It's meant to be. Yahuwah wants to save every individual he can, so he allows this final climax to awaken souls. But the gospel of the kingdom of Yah is that, beyond the traumatic events of the near future, an eternity of bliss awaits all who accept Yah's gift of salvation. When Yahushua returns, all who've died trusting in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior will be raised back to life in the first resurrection. Yahushua will then set up Yah's kingdom on earth. He and the redeemed will reign jointly on the earth for the first thousand years of eternity. Since the cataclysmic events preceding Yahushua's return will render the earth uninhabitable, Yahuwah will then recreate a whole new world. John saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. If you wish to join with the redeemed of all ages, living a life that measures with the life of Yahuwah, make the choice. Accept salvation today. You don't have to get yourself ready. The truth is, you can't. Neither can I. No one can. Come to Him just as you are. Don't wait until you've quit sinning. You're not going to get better through your own efforts. Accept Yahuwah's invitation to become a member of His eternal earthly kingdom. When you accept this precious invitation, Yahuwah will gift you with a brand new heart. In Ezekiel 36, verse 26, he declares, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Accepting this priceless gift is the only way for joining His kingdom. Come to Yahuwah just as you are. He's waiting with arms wide open, eager to receive all who come to Him. been listening to WLC Radio. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return.